This is an overview of particle characterization in the cosmetics industry. Uh, not so much focused on the instruments today as the application and then talking about for given applications which might be the appropriate technology. I'll start by showing a slide. We're talking about, first of all, since we're, this is a particle characterization webinar, we'll talk about what particles are found in cosmetics. And, you know, first of all, we can just think of anywhere where there's a powder, and there are quite a few powders used in cosmetics. Uh, these could be pigments, it could be things like talc, it could be mica, death, glitter. So anywhere where there is a powder, there's an interest in the particle size, perhaps also the shape of the material being used in the cosmetics product. We think of emulsions as also being particles. These are liquid-liquid emulsions, probably an oil and water emulsion. And we think of those liquid droplets as being particles, and we could think of face creams and lotions where the droplet size of the emulsion, usually the oil, is important both for its performance and for stability. We'll talk about some more complex particle systems when we move on to talking about liposomes and how they can be used to encapsulate or to deliver particles to the skin surface and to penetrate it. And down here I just show some of the types of cosmetics containing particles, uh, including emulsions. Uh, certainly for the lips we can think of the pigment used for lipstick, for the face, the foundation, the rouge, many of these can be particle-based particle products. Uh, there are particle materials inside mascara. And then also, you know, we also do work with things like shampoos, the emulsions in shampoos. We spend a lot of time working with customers on that. So there actually are quite a few different products where particle size is important, and we currently support customers in this industry. Uh, as I did research for this presentation today, I was looking for, you know, what were some of the original powder or particle-based cosmetics, and I found out there's a cosmetic foundation called Pancake, which was originated by Max Factor, and I had no idea just how popular this was. Uh, this was apparently the first foundation, which over the person's face, typically a lady's, and this was one of the first materials where it was not an oil-based foundation, but a particle-based foundation. In this case, it was talc and was applied with a wet sponge. Uh, Max Factor patented this in 1937, and according to the research I looked at, apparently by 1940, one in three North American women owned and wore pancake. And here's a picture of a very glamorous actress from that era, and uh, this was apparently very, began in Hollywood and then spread for use throughout North America and uh, was probably the most successful cosmetic launch in history, from what I read. Now, I am not a cosmetic chemist, but the approach I used to start discussing the topic is I said, well, what if we want to create our own cosmetic material? And the people in the audience who are cosmetic chemists, please grant some poetic license, understanding my field is characterization, not creating new cosmetics. But if I wanted to create a new product and look at how particle size, shape, et cetera, would affect this product, I said, well, let's make something that'd be like a foundation. And we'll start with a base, and uh, we, instead of using talc, maybe I'll use something like rice powder as my base. Uh, if we want to change the color of the skin, we could add a pigment, maybe I'll use something like iron oxide. I might use a filler, such as clay, to fill in some of the pores. I might decide I'd like a little glitter, and I'll use some uh, coated mica for that. And then also, since uh, I happen to be a very fair-skinned person, I always like to wear sunscreen, and maybe I'll use something like titanium dioxide to add some SPF to this base cosmetic. Now you'll notice all of these materials are particles. They all happen to be powders. And it turns out every one of these ingredients could be measured with one system, and that's the LA950, which we show here. And we could probably measure actually all of these as a dry powder, as you see here. But as we go through each of these materials, I'll also just talk about how we measured these materials in our applications laboratory. When we want to measure powders, we can measure them directly as powders using the LA950. You see up here just adding the powder to a vibrating tray. What you see in the middle here is a picture of here's the Venturi. And this is the dry powder cell used to present the powder to the instrument for measurement. Compressed air is entered here. And we can we can bring in compressed air anyone from zero to four bars with an infinite number of gradations along those along that range. 
Uh, we will then draw the powder and drive it through here, the measurement zone, and collect it in a vacuum. And what we do is we have a feedback control loop so that we can change the vibrating feed rate on this tray to have a constant mass flow through the optics for the measurement, which is very important, to get the most reproducible measurements. And when given a chance, I try to measure powders as dry powders because it's quick, it's easy, and also having managed a laboratory in the past, if we use a dry powder feeder, there's no glassware to clean. All the material just ends up in the vacuum bag, which we just change once a month. So I actually went online and bought these materials, and I bought some rice powder. We measured this on the LA950. You can see here we used three bar. Uh, this is the information you can see on how we measured the sample in terms of the refracted index, how did we measure it. And then what you see here are the, mode, the points on the distribution, the D90, D50, D10. If you're not familiar with those numbers, 90% of the distribution is below the D90. 50% is below the D50, that's the median value, and 10% are below the D10. Down here we have a graphical representation of that particle size distribution, where if this is 10 microns, you see the median is near 8.5 microns. Very simple measurement. We could probably knock off three of these measurements in the course of one minute. So we might start by looking at what is the particle size of our base powder. Because when you're going to do mixing the powders, it actually helps if the powders are close in size. Otherwise, as you mix the powder, you might deal with some segregation. So if we know what our base is, that might help us decide what kind of size range would we want our other components to be. We don't always have that under control, but it's nice to know and would be like to try to keep those size ranges as close as possible for proper mixing. But as we look at the next material I'm going to add, which was to add a pigment, which is iron oxide, what you see here, this was a much smaller particle size. This had a median of around a half a micron. Now, a half a micron, we could still measure that as a dry powder with the dry powder feeder, but in this case, what we decided to do was measure it using the system using a wet dispersion. So here is a wet reservoir, and we simply recirculate the sample for the measurement. The LA950 actually has several wet accessories, and we can usually, for these samples, if it's dispersed in water, just use the base system here, which has a reservoir on the range of a liter. But we can use smaller volumes of samples if we wish, if we were trying to work with materials where perhaps we need to suspend it in a solvent, and we want to minimize the use of solvent. But one of the other reasons we might want to use a wet dispersion for this powder is that as you look at these results, you see that, here is the graphical representation, we see these larger particles and then the main peak. And possibly this might be an indication there's some agglomeration here, and we might want to use ultrasound to break up these agglomerates. But although often the goal is to measure the particle in its primary state, in this case I think we decided we didn't want to do that because what we're really interested in is what is the natural state of the powder as we use it. Because if we want to think about the function of using a pigment, the absorption characteristics of color we see is dependent on the size range. And so as you apply it, you're not going to use ultrasound. So as we measure this, we chose not to use ultrasound as well. So we can under the size distribution of the powder in the state as it was being used. To add some glitter to this, we decided we might add some gold glitter powder, which is most often a coated mica. And what we did here, we see here the particle size is up in the range of 100 microns. And we could measure that wet or dry. So in this case, we measured it both ways. What you see with the blue curve here and to the right is we measured it as a dry powder, and you see a median size of about 107 microns. We then took the same powder and dispersed it in water, and we saw we got a slightly small result at about 100 microns. And that's not unusual. When you take a powder and suspend it in a liquid, you reduce the surface tension. And when you reduce the surface tension, particles that are stuck together made us naturally dispersed to a more primary state. But essentially, these results are about the same. A D90 near 150, a D50 near 100, and a D10 at about, we'll say, 70 microns. Sometimes, if we're going to choose to do the measurement dry, it's nice to measure it wet as well, just so we can verify, does the dry result make sense? And it might also help us choose the correct pressure for the dry powder feeder. For instance, in this case, if we could run that up to a slightly higher air pressure and the dry powder feeders can now work up to four bar, 
if we saw a perfect overlay, we might think that that is a better pressure. <clears throat> so we also use comparing what to dry for our method development when using the dry powder feeder. The next thing we did is we said, well, that's interesting. We got similar results wet and dry. Let's use another technique to characterize this material. The next technique we use in our laboratory to support what we're doing with laser diffraction or to get additional information is to use image analysis. This is the PSA 300 static image analysis system where we disperse the particles using this powder disperser, where we place the sample and the slide inside this containment zone. We draw a vacuum. We then release the vacuum through a nozzle, and the particles then will fall on the slide. The slide is brought into the instrument, and as the slide moves, we take images of the particles, and for every image of particles we take, we assign size and shape values to those particles. So we use the PSA 300 to do a measurement of the same glitter powder. You see the results here, and it's fairly similar in results. A D90 near 150, a D50 at 100, <coughs> and a D10 at 60 microns. So in this case, we actually have verified that the results from laser diffraction look accurate because image analysis is the referee technique for particle size analysis. But in addition, we'll also get shape information. And perhaps when we're looking at glitter powder, the particle shape may be important. Now there are quite a few shape parameters we could use to describe the glitter powder or any other powder. I show here there's actually an ISO document which shows a standardized way to calculate the shape of particles. But let's say we want to know how round are the particles. We could use a circularity calculation, which is shown here, where A is the area and P is the perimeter of the particles. We could use aspect ratio. We could use convexity. What we should see over here is for the uh, glitter powder, the roundness distribution. I'm showing roundness here. Roundness of one means they're a perfect sphere. And as that number decreases, the particles are less and less round. And what we see here is the roundness distribution of the particles, which may be of interest so that we could control not only the size of the particles, but also the shape. Uh, we also just bought some mica powder, which was not coated to include in our handmade cosmetics. Uh, this is not the mica as we bought it, just a picture to remind you what mica is. But we also bought some mica where we see it's a fairly tight particle size distribution with a median at 5 microns. I would assume this mica was probably uh, milled and then either sieved or used some sort of um, way to separate the particles to create this nice narrow distribution of particles, which will then cause less segregation if we were to mix this into other materials. I'd mentioned maybe we'll add a filler to our homemade cosmetic. And what we did here is we used clay, kaolin clay, which is most people consider the purest form of clay. You can see here we dispersed this as a wet dispersion. We took the powder and we dispersed it using a surfactant. And when we measured this using the LA950, a powder dispersed in water, what we see are two peaks, a larger and a smaller, with a D50 at two and a half microns. And the point you see here is at 0.1 microns, that is 100 nanometers. Now just make a note here that <clears throat> the general definition of a nanoparticle is something below 100 nanometers. So if we were to use this scale in clay, we'd see that a small percentage of the total will be less than 100 nanometers. And that doesn't strike me as terribly concerning, but as we discuss safety of nanoparticles, which is an issue in the cosmetics industry later in today's talk, I found it interesting to think that just naturally occurring clay has nanoparticles. And I'm assuming people have been exposed to clay through the ages, and I'm not aware of this having caused safety concerns to date. Now, personally, the, sun, the cream I use on my face every day contains a sunscreen because I'm a fair-skinned person and I'm trying to take care of my skin. And so we could add a powder to our homemade cosmetic facial foundation as well. <clears throat> we had purchased some titanium dioxide this titanium dioxide we dispersed in water, and you see here a D50 of 0.155 microns, or 155 nanometers. You'll see here that a significant portion, well, 14% of this titanium dioxide lies below 100 nanometers, 
And it turns out this is currently a point of debate within the cosmetics industry and people not within the industry of the safety of adding these materials below 100 nanometers and applying them to the skin. Uh, another material we could add to our cosmetics to give an SPF factor in order to make a sunscreen would be zinc oxide. Uh, this result is actually going to a store and buying a sunscreen that contained zinc oxide. And we measured it without ultrasound and then with ultrasound while preparing the sample. And what you see is that a significant portion of this is down below 100 nanometers. And at the percent under 100 nanometers will depend on how do we measure the sample. In this case, should we use ultrasound or not? So this zinc, ox zinc oxide was actually zinc oxide I was familiar with. And I knew that for the, since this particular zinc oxide was in a sunscreen, there would be a percentage underneath 100 nanometers. Now the reason I know this zinc oxide is actually it is formulated and sold to cosmetic companies making sunscreens and I happen to just know the people who did the formulation and created this product years ago. And this is actually called the uh, Z-Coat which is a transparent zinc oxide. Uh, what we see here in the upper left is the absorption spectrum for this particular zinc oxide. This is wavelength and this is absorption. This is zinc oxide and this is titanium dioxide. So as I choose which powder I might add to my uh, sunscreen formulation, either it's a face lotion or just uses a sunscreen, probably what would make sense is the broadest absorption band I can find because that way this particular zinc oxide formulation actually absorbs all the way up to 400 nanometers, which is absorbing not only in the UVB range, but also in the UVA range. So actually, if I were creating a sunscreen, I might choose this zinc oxide because it has a very broad spectrum of absorption. That's also showed here more graphically on the right, comparing the absorption spectrum for zinc oxide compared to titanium dioxide. Or there are also chemicals that are used as sunscreens a common being uh, OMC oxymethoxycinamate. And probably if I were going to create a, uh, sun a face cream that included zinc oxide as a sunscreen, I might also include OMC because as you see here, just the zinc oxide would give us an SPF of 5.6. But if we do a formulation in combination with OMC, we have an additive effect here, a synergistic effect. And now I could create a sunscreen with an SPF value of 20. So as we're creating our own face cream, that might be something we want to do, is now we're adding our first chemical OMC in order to boost the SPF factor. So I had mentioned before there's some concern with using small particles in sunscreens. This is not a picture of me, but uh, your humble narrator actually happened to be a lifeguard back in, uh, that would have been the very early 70s. And I mentioned I'm a very, um, fair-skinned person, so actually when I was a lifeguard, circa 1973 or so, most lifeguards wore zinc oxide cream that basically looked like paint, like what you see this person wearing, because our noses burned much worse than the rest of our body in general. And back in the early 70s, this is what most lifeguards would look like, is would put zinc oxide on our nose and on our lips, and uh, it was uh, a wise thing to do in order to try to reduce the risk of sun cancer. Uh, the zinc oxide that is smaller that you see now actually is so small it appears transparent. And that's why the smaller size is of more interest to be used for sunscreen because then it's transparent and you look like yourself, which in many cases might be appropriate or preferred. So since we're using smaller and smaller particles to make this transparent but still have an SPF factor, these particles are below 100 nanometers and there have been publications written raising concerns with the risk of using small particles for sunscreens. So this particular document was uh, prepared by an NGO called Friends of the Earth, where they're saying, you know, some nanoparticles appear to have some toxicity to human tissues, so why don't we just ban all, part, all products with particles below 100 nanometers? So that is one side of this argument. On the next slide I'll say, well, so this is what an NGO who's concerned might say, well, you know, why don't we just get rid of all these 
cosmetics with particles below 100 nanometers because we have seen somewhere that some nanoparticles are dangerous, so let's ban them all. It should be nanoparticles. Uh, and then the cosmetic industry might come back and say, well, you know, so that was actually something that was very unique. Uh, most nanoparticles are safe. We shouldn't worry about that. So here in the U.S., it's usually the FDA who needs to get involved. And the FDA is currently reviewing this, but have stated they only will refer to data they view in peer-reviewed journals. What I find interesting is that the European community has already decided that uh, they've passed legislation and in two years, cosmetic manufacturers will have to notify the European Commission if there are any quote unquote nanoscale, nanoscale materials in the products. So this might lead people who make cosmetics to wonder, all right, do I have, do I have nanoparticles in my products? In the world of particle size analysis, how you do the measurement greatly influences the reported size. I'm going to show you an example here of nanoparticles where that is true. Let's say that we're creating these nanoparticles where each particle has a diameter near 50 nanometers. If I were to measure this using a scanning electron microscope and just measure the diameter of these particles, I would report this as a 50 nanometer particle. If I were to measure the surface area of these particles, only a small part of the surface area is at the contact point. And so if I do a surface area measurement, then I can convert surface area to mean diameter using this equation. The diameter reported from surface area might be in the range of also 60 to 70 nanometers. But if I were to take these particles and measure them using dynamic light scattering, the light scattering technique that measures Brownian motion and calculates particle size, this particle behaves as a particle that is joined together as it is seen here. And using dynamic light scattering, we would report something in the range of 250 nanometers. So are these nanoparticles or not? It depends on how you measure it. It depends on how you report the results. Now I could take this sample, treat it with ultrasound, probably an ultrasonic probe, or maybe I could expose it to some weak acid to try to break these bonds. And then I could measure it using dynamic light scattering. I would probably get a result near 50 nanometers. But still, I don't think we've answered the question, were those nanoparticles to begin or not? Because this particle is actually behaving as a larger agglomerate of particles in most ways. And in terms of penetration through the skin layer, it would be behaving as an agglomerate at 250 nanometers, not as the individual particles. So I'm raising this as an issue that must be addressed by people trying to understand the situation. And certainly, is it a nanoparticle or not is something we will have to be careful with understanding and also careful with our experimental techniques. Now let's think of some of the techniques we could use to investigate these kinds of particles. One of the techniques would be using acoustic spectroscopy. And this actually is a study that was carried out by Dispersion Technology, the company who we work with, who manufactured the DT-1201. And what happened in this study is the people doing the studies went out to the market, bought commercially available zinc oxide, reporting here the median particle size in this column, and here is the percent of particles below 100 nanometers. And what we see is this zinc oxide had the largest percent of small particles, and this had the smallest percent. And so what was done was a study taking this as a base and then adding, excuse me, starting this as a base and then taking, starting this as a base and then taking some of the smaller particles, adding it to the base and making sure the technique was sensitive to the presence of the smaller particles. This is just the data of all the individual materials as shown before. And then what was done was a direct addition test where we were trying to look at the percent of the very small particles. What we see here is just the attenuation spectrum on the left of the largest and smallest of the samples used in the study, the base in the study. We see a significant difference in the attenuation spectrum on the left. And on the right, a significant difference in the particle size distribution. So this would be our base, this would be our dopant. And what we did is a plot of, as we added small amounts of the dopant, compared the calculated percent of particles below 100 nanometers to the measured. And what we see is a very tight fit down across this curve down to 2%. So what we proved in this study is using acoustic attenuation 
proved very successful to detect the presence of these nanoparticles down to a couple of percent. This is just a picture of the instrument used for those acoustic studies. This is the DT-1201. The sample just added here, often without dilution. We have a transducer and a detector, and we look at attenuation as a function of distance between the transducer and the detector. In the same instrument, we can also measure the charge on the surface of the particles, the zeta potential. This is an acoustic zeta potential probe, or CVI probe. And what we do here is we're actually going to oscillate an acoustic wave through a sample, going out through a gold um, coating here. And the particles directly in front of this part of the rod is exposed to an oscillating acoustic wave. Since an oscillating acoustic wave is passing in front and through these particles, what happens is since the particles have more inertia than the liquid, and it's an oscillating wave, we build up a dipole moment of ions on the surface of the particle here. So there is a disproportionate charge on the left and right. We build up a dipole moment. We actually create a small current through here of the particles in front of the probe and those to the side. We calculate that vibration current and from there can measure the zeta potential. The zeta potential is the charge on the surface of the particle. Here is a particle with a negatively charged surface. If we put that into a suspension with ions, positive ions will be attracted to the negative surface of the particles. And then negative and positive ions will be attracted to these ions and we'll end up with a double layer around the surface of those particles. Now the zeta potential is actually the charge measured in millivolts at this distance from the surface of the particle. That distance is called the slipping plane because at this distance these ions move with the particle as the particle moves through the suspension. So the zeta potential is a potential measured in millivolts at this distance from the surface of the particles. And the zeta potential of the particles is very interesting when we're dealing with submicron dispersions or emulsions and can be used for people in the cosmetics industry to do formulation of new products. The way that can be used is usually what we're trying to do either with a dispersion of small particles or an emulsion is the goal is to create a stable dispersion. If we don't have a stable dispersion and we have solid particles, they might sediment or flocculate, which would not be so good. If we're making an emulsion product, such as an oil and water emulsion, we want a stable emulsion, usually involves small droplets. And what we're trying to avoid is either coalescence or phase separation due to creaming. So what we're interested in are the size of the particles, but also what can we do to change the surface charge or the surface properties so the particles don't aggregate and start phase separating. There are two basic ways to do stabilization of dispersions. The first is to add a polymer to the surface. These yellow squiggly lines are polymers added to the surface. And if we add polymer to the surface of the particles, they can't interact and we'll call that steric stabilization. Another route we can change this particle system to make it more stable is to add a charge onto the surface of the particles. Then they repel like magnets in this way, they don't interact, don't start sedimenting, don't start aggregating, and we can make a more stable dispersion. We call this approach electrostatic stabilization. If we're going to use electrostatic stabilization for our products, then the zeta potential is very important. So we build up now to how might we use this tool. For instance, let's say we were making uh, titanium dioxide to go into a sunscreen product. Well, what you see here on this graph is this is zeta potential. This is a negative zeta potential. That's positive. This is pH across this axis. That's going from a pH of 2 up to 12. Uh, the lower plot shows us zeta potential as a function of pH of rutile, one of the forms of titanium dioxide. And what we see is if we raise the pH up from 7 up through 11, we have a zeta potential near minus 40 something, and that predicts this will be a stable suspension. And sure enough, if we measure the particle size of this titanium dioxide where the pH is near nine, we have a nice single peak near 300 nanometers. But if we reduce the pH to the point where there is no zeta potential, which is called the isoelectric point, as we strip that surface charge off the surface of the particles, then they will start aggregating. And if we perform the particle size measurement now, we'll see that we actually start seeing the aggregates of those materials. 
So if we're going to create products using titanium dioxide or perhaps zinc oxide, and we're interested in creating these stable dispersions to avoid aggregation, it's a very good idea to also be looking at the zeta potential of the system and to adjust the pH, for instance, or the surface chemistry other ways, such as the use of surfactants, so that we can make stable dispersions where we are avoiding the isoelectric point. So that's an example where we're measuring not only particle size, but the zeta potential in order to formulate a stable product for use as a cosmetic, perhaps as a sunscreen. Another material that we bought just off the shelves to understand cosmetics in some of the particle size distributions is we went out and we bought a skin cream that had some SPF. We measured the particle size distribution using the LA950. And what we saw here, this actually was a cream, so it was an emulsion-based product. And we did see there were some particles below 100 nanometers, but this wasn't a product where we had much information, so we weren't sure if these nanoparticles were actually an emulsion or actually were a mineral product. But the particle size is very important for emulsions. Sometimes particle size alone can be a predictor of whether we will have a stable product or if it will phase separate with time. We may also be interested in zeta potential because surfactants are used to coat the surface of emulsions to make them more stable. And as we coat the surface using different concentrations of surfactants, that could also help stabilize the material. So we performed a study of a hexane in water emulsion, used the acoustic instrument to measure this was the oil and water emulsion without any surfactant and we see a particle size up on the scale of a micron. That's with no surfactant. Then we used aerosol OT, a common surfactant, added that to the system, and as we added some aerosol OT to the system, all of a sudden we started creating this much smaller particle size distribution that had a larger zeta potential. And this way we used both size and zeta potential to help us do formulation of an emulsion. Now there are lots of emulsions used in the pharmaceutical industry. I'd mentioned so far things like creams, which are semi-solid emulsions, usually oil and water emulsions, but there are many other cosmetic materials as well, such as ointments, where there are particle-based to the systems. Uh, they can either be water-based, typically water-based, but usually we're trying to do is look at ways where we're taking an oil, dispersing it in water, and using this for some kind of an ointment. There are also products called liniments, or we might use the word balm. This is usually a topical uh, preparation. And usually what we have to do with the balm or liniment is actually we need some friction to rub it onto the surface in order to have it adhere to the surface. And also we could think of paste. And in all these cases, there probably are some particle system, either in the liniment or the paste, where the particle size distribution is important both for the formulator and also just as ways to test the product. So I went out to the internet and started doing some searches for emulsions and cosmetics and uh, just found a patent without too much looking. Uh, this was a patent where I found even in the patent, they note they did the particle size measurements using the LB500, which is a dynamic light scattering instrument made by Hariba. And what you see here is they're comparing the inventive material to the comparative material. And I apologize, this isn't crystal clear, but in the other comparative material, which is called cloudy, you'll see the droplet size of the emulsion is in the range of 0.3 up to a micron or so. But with the inventive product in this patent, they're saying, look, our particle sizes are all down under 120 nanometers, and we have a transparent material. What this usually says to me is what they're doing is actually changing the creation of this emulsion and making a microemulsion. Microemulsions are transparent, they're thermodynamically stable, and generally won't stay separate. So this is an example where a patent is based on creating an emulsion as opposed to a macroemulsion, which is expected to therefore be transparent and actually have a better shelf life. Uh, some other places, I actually saw quite a few places, I did some searches on people posting right on their spec sheet that they're using Hariba instruments. Uh, this is one example where, as pointed out, they're using a Hariba LA900, and this was for a liposome. And what we're showing here is the um, different ways where the preparation can actually uh, be applied and penetrate to the skin, and that is based on the particle size of the liposome as measured on an LA900. 
Now, if you're not familiar with the liposomes, I'll talk a little bit here about liposomal delivery, which is used on many cosmetic products now. A liposome, by the way, is essentially you take surfactants, and as you formulate them a certain way, you build up this double layer of a uh, surfactant. So this could be a phospholipid. And what we can have here is we can create a hydrophilic zone in the center and a hydrophobic zone here. What we could do, perhaps, is take particles here, this could be an active ingredient of some type, encapsulate it, and then find ways to introduce this to the skin so that either we improve the shelf life of this, or in this case, we can actually formulate some liposomes so we can actually penetrate the skin barrier with the active ingredient. Now, the concern that I've spoken about in the past with the zinc oxide in the sunscreens, the concern with people there is that do the particles penetrate the skin surface? And I haven't personally seen any articles yet to suggest that sub-100 nanometer zinc oxides uh, penetrate the skin surface. In general, they're blocked at the horny layer. But there may be times where we want to pass through the skin layer to create, uh, to actually to uh, um, deliver these small particles through the skin layer. So what we could do is encapsulate the active ingredient particles in the liposome. Here you see a picture of it approaching the skin layer. Then actually as the liposome hits the skin layer, it starts dissolving. <coughs> and as it starts dissolving, we can actually disrupt the skin layer and have these particles fuse and then pass through the skin layer so that these active ingredient particles actually have passed through the skin layer. Now what might be an example where we'd want to do that? And now we're getting to, I'd said, you know what, well, I admitted I use a cosmetic material. I actually use a uh, face cream every day that includes retinol. And one of the ways to apply retinol is to actually try to get it to transport through the skin layer by delivering it encapsulated inside liposomes. Uh, liposomes tend to be down in the range of 250 to 100 nanometers. Uh, by the way, there is an application note on our website for measuring liposomes using dynamic light scattering, where you'll see data using the LB550. Uh, and it just talks about creating these liposomes as we create more shear to them, reducing the particle size. I show our new URL here to, at fariba.com to get to the particle characterization area. So if you're interested in the use of liposomes to deliver products to uh, the skin surface or to pass through the skin surface, you'll probably be using dynamic light scattering and could find that of interest. So retinol is interesting. Uh, retinol is also, I mean, it's basically vitamin A. These are two graphical representations of retinol. And usually what uh, we're doing with skin cream is trying to reduce the effect of wrinkles or aging to the skin. Uh, sometimes it's just being caused by exposure to the sun, like us old ex-lifeguards. Uh, so people are often using now skin creams using retinol. And there are all kinds of formulations of retinol into, sense, into skin cream because retinol is a fairly unstable particle. I did a quick search on the internet and found all kinds of patents and ways to uh, encapsulate retinol. This is uh, encapsulating it into liposomes. You could also find other ways to encapsulate retinol because actually retinol will have a greater effect on your wrinkles if it can pass through that first surface of the skin. So here's a case where the particle size would be very important, the formulation would be important. And actually we're looking at encapsulating the retinol inside the core space of vesicles or liposomes uh, where that diameter is on the range of 10 to 50 nanometers. So actually this is very small down below that size range. And I found lots of listings of ingredients. This actually came from an Asian website where the active ingredient is retinol <coughs> encapsulated as a liposome. So as I look at it, there are all kinds of complex particles now where particle characterization is very important in the cosmetics industry. Uh, we started by looking at powders and just talking about powder-based materials, how they can be measured, and a wide range of them could just be measured using a single laser diffraction instrument, the LA950. If you want shape information, we might use something like image analysis to get the shape of the glitter flakes. We can use acoustics to measure both the size and zeta potential. Uh, acoustics has the additional benefit where there's no dilution with our measurements. If we're doing measurements all below a micron, we can use dynamic light scattering, which can be used for particle size and also for zeta potential of dilute systems. 
So lots of tools for particle characterization in the cosmetics industry, ranging from let's measure powder to measuring complex engineered nanoparticles. I'd like to also say there's many more details you can find on both these techniques and applications if you look at our website. I note some application notes here which may be of interest to people attending this webinar, including how to measure emulsions using acoustics, a basic application note on measuring particle size with cosmetic materials, an application note on nanomaterials using acoustics. This was the study I showed earlier of measuring the zinc oxide. There is an application note on measuring liposomes using dynamic light scattering. And I also want to point out that, that webinars such as today's are stored and are on the website for viewing, including a webinar which may be of interest to people considering laser diffraction as a technique, people who would like to know, learn more about acoustic spectrometers, and if you have an interest in dynamic light scattering, there's also a webinar there on using dynamic light scattering to look at the size and stability of materials. This one is specifically biotech and nanotech, but could be equally applicable to cosmetic materials. So that is a presentation I prepared for today. I'll check in now with Ian and see if as we've gone along, we've generated any questions as we've gone through the presentation. 